Welcome to Caregiver Relief, the podcast where we venture into the often unspoken realm of aging and mortality with honesty and openness. Today's topic, dying to talk, exploring death through cards, care, and cafe. We invite you to delve into the profound intersection of life's final chapter and the transformative power of conversation in in illuminating its path. I'm your host, Diane Carbo, registered nurse, and I have a deep-seated commitment to navigating the complexities of health, illness, and the journey towards life's end. And today, we are very privileged to have two remarkable guests with us. First, we welcome Lisa Paul. She's a licensed certified social worker, She's a trailblazer in the conversation on death and dying. Lisa's extensive background in social work, particularly in hospice and emergency medicine, has culminated in the creation of the Death Deck, a game that fosters open and meaningful discussions about the end of life. Her belief in the cathartic power of the dialogue has made the death deck an invaluable resource for those seeking to find peace in life's finality. Lisa's professional journey, enriched with experiences in community, mental health, domestic violence, and trauma, has led her to discover the precious nature of life in the stillness beside those at the end of their journey and their families. Beyond her professional endeavors, Lisa finds balance and joy in the serenity of nature, from kayaking after whales to savoring moments with her family and her playful kids. We also have joining Lisa in today's episode is Alicia Hurd. Alicia's academic background includes a BS in elementary education and behavioral studies, a foundation that has informed her compassionate career and caring for emotionally disturbed and behaviorally challenged children. But Alicia's expertise extends far beyond the classroom. She has been the lighthouse in the storm for her family, acting as the primary caregiver for her mother, then her mother-in-law, and most recently her father. It is through these profound personal experiences that Alicia found her calling as a death doula as well as a caregiver coach roles in which she supports individuals and families during their most vulnerable moments. In addition to her invaluable work, Alicia is a regular contributor to Caregiver Relief, where she shares her insights and supports others with her wealth of knowledge. Her dedication to caregiving has also led her to become a coach guiding others through the complexities and challenges of this critical role. Together, Lisa and Alicia and I are going to offer different perspectives on the end-of-life experience, one through the lens of an innovative communication and other through the heartfelt caregiving. As we gather here today, let's extend a warm welcome to both Lisa and Alicia. We're set to embark on an enlightening journey uncovering the peace that comes from understanding and embracing the end of life as an integral part of our human experience. Lisa, I want to thank you for your groundbreaking work with the death deck. And thank you, Alicia, for your compassionate guidance as a death doula. We also aim to shed light on what a death cafe is as we explore our roles in society. So I want to start this important conversation to discover how embracing mortality can enrich our appreciation of life itself. So Lisa, I'm going to start with you first. Can you explain the concept behind the death deck and what inspired you to co-create it? Yes. Thank you again, Diane, for having me here. I'm excited to be in company with Alicia as well. We began, so I have been a hospice social worker for about 17 years. A few years into my career, I met Lori. Lori is the wife of Joe. And Joe was on service with us for about two weeks and two days. And so I was the hospice social worker that helped Lori and Joe and their two young children. He died in his early 40s, and I provided bereavement support afterwards. And then Lori reached out to me a few years later, and we met up for coffee. And we started talking about how many things 
Lori wished she had known about what Joe would want at the end of his life. And through my work in hospice and emergency medicine, I have seen that most people aren't prepared. And so even if they have documents in place, like Lori and Joe did, there were no conversations about all the nuances related to end-of-life care. As an example, did Joe want to use all medications to keep him as comfortable as possible, or was it more important to be as alert as possible? And so these were some of the questions that we began talking about, and we started looking at what tools were out there to help people have these conversations. And we found some great ones, but they seemed a little bit more touchy-feely and loving, which is amazing. But we were looking for something a little different. How can we get younger people, how can we get people of all ages to start talking about death and dying? And so we decided, let's add a little humor. Let's add multiple choice questions. That way, people have an easier time engaging in the topic because death uh, to most people is scary and the topic is avoided. And so we just want to help people begin having these conversations so that when they, have a, when they are confronted with a terminal diagnosis or a medical emergency, they have some understanding and their family members have some understanding of what they would want. I, I yeah. love your concept. I want to share a story about my dad. My son mm. went into the hospital all jaundiced and was uh, not feeling well. And uh, they did a Whipple procedure on him, which is a, a really challenging proce procedure for anyone to go through. And he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now, my dad is a, was a letter carrier, a postal carrier. And he sat in while the doctor told him, Lee, you have less than six months to live. The first thoughts of my dad were every year, every other year, he went to Hawaii. We, we're from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And every year, every other year, he would go to Hawaii. He got a timeshare there and he would go for six weeks. And I'll never forget the look on his face when the doctor told him that he had less than six months to live. And my dad said, oh, well, I'm going to have to give up on my Hawaii trip. And I, here's me, the smart aleck, hardcore nurse, saying, Dad, you're not dead yet. If you can go, we'll get you there. I said, do you care if you die there? And he goes, no. I said, it's solved. If you're well enough to travel and take the plane trip, I'll get you on hospice over there. And that's what we did. And I want you to know that when he got over there, because I'm very open about it, and I'll explain why in, in a minute about death and dying. But my dad went over to Hawaii, had this amazing spiritual healing, and felt so well that they took him off hospice after three days there. And he was there for the full six weeks. And the day before he left to come home, he started feeling not unwell. And I, I, and the reason why I was so excited when I saw the death deck was I, my mom, when I was a junior in high school, was going to have, had to have gallbladder surgery. And it was at that time they detected she had lung cancer. Now, my dad is the old Navy guy, the letter carrier, the staunch, we don't talk about this. And I'm the oldest of four. When my mom was going through her cancer treatments, I'm the one that took care of her. I'm the one. I became the family caregiver at 16 and 17. And we weren't allowed to talk, say the C word. We weren't allowed to have a discussion about death and dying. We were not allowed to do any of that. And um, the irony here is my mom uh, w went to the oncologist after all of her god-awful, terrible treatments, you know, the cobalt at that time. And the oncologist said to her, Louise, you beat cancer. You're going to have a quick Christmas. And it was, so my mom, I'm, I'm a freshman in nursing school. And I'm strict, I'm right across the street at the nursing school of the hospital. My mom is on her way over to tell me we're going to have 
a good Christmas. We have a lot to be thankful for. And on the way down in the elevator, le just leaving the oncologist's office, she threw a pulmonary embolism and was put in intensive care, and she died that night. I am, I'm very open and blatant about death and dying. And I thought the death deck was just a, an impressive way to open the communication, open the lines of communication on a difficult topic. Lisa, could you share some particularly memorable moments or conversations that arose from using the death deck? Yes, one very memorable one is that I take the death deck everywhere I go. And I even have, we put 10 to 12 on little rings so you can flip through them 10 at a time and then you can throw them in your purse. And so I was carrying around some rings in my purse and I brought out the death deck at this, my neighborhood wine bar that I like to go to. Oh, oh. And I started asking people questions. And initially people are looking at me, what is this girl doing? And then I, there were so many amazing stories shared. One gentleman told, talked about his wife who was on hospice. He was currently a caregiver and he had just slipped out from his caregiving duties. His brother had come over and relieved him. And so he had come for a drink and, and it became such a lovely community of conversation. And then this other young couple was at the bar and we're having this conversation about <clears throat> advanced care planning. And they told me before they left that, that during the appointment, they had reached out to an estate planner because they realized that they really needed to get a living will because they have two young kids. And so those moments where people, the two things I love most are these deep connections that we have when we talk about this topic because it's so soul affirming and it's so validating to, for people to be able to share their stories and also what they think and believe on this topic that no one talks to them about. So I love the connection and community that comes from that. And then the second piece is I love when people take action, you know, that this inspired them yeah. to be back and prepare because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yes, that's an example for you. I can tell you as a nurse who worked at an, a world-renowned cancer center, I brought up the topic of hospice and death and dying to a young woman who was not long for this world. And I got fired for bringing the topic of hospice up to her. And I felt so bad, but I learned that it's in the cancer centers it's not about being open and honest. It's all about research and money and finances. And that's a whole other topic. But it's just sad people aren't given choices, especially in the cancer centers. They'll, and and I, I believe that everybody has a choice to make their decision on, on whether they want treatment or not and how far they want to go. But the doctors don't care if they disarmed, were inhumane in, the, in their treatment and People end up not being able to eat and all kinds of things, but they beat cancer and it's, it makes me sad. So I'm a person who's, hey, I lost the job. You know, they got him a nurse so I could get another one because I was open and honest. So I have a question for you, Lisa. In what ways do you think society's attitude toward death and dying needs to change? And how does the death that contribute to that change? Yeah, I think we're making a little progress. I think with so many people interested in becoming death doulas and end of life doulas, which I know Alicia's going to talk about, that's helping further the conversation. We're seeing even articles in People magazine about hospice nurses. So I do think that we are starting to be slightly more open in talking about death and dying. But in general, I also know that my view is a little slated because I'm in this space. And so sometimes I think that everyone knows things and they don't. That part is true too. But I, people are afraid to talk about difficult things overall. Money, taxes, yep. um, sex, relationships. relationships. <laughs> we, it's hard. It's yes. hard to have 
conversations that make people uncomfortable and and we tend to avoid it. And I think there's a lot of generational teaching that goes on about death and dying. And so if you weren't exposed to death and dying as a kid, you may have pretty significant fears about that. So in general, I think we we are still a death avoidant society. I think we still are referring to hospice late. Um, way late, way, way. But it makes me sad. Yes. Right. But we are trying to bring death into the community. So last night, we hosted a death over drafts event at the brewery down the street from me. Wow, that's and, cool. And we had about, we had a good 30 people show up from the community and we, oh, which was wonderful. And so I had a microphone and we're at a brewery and we're talking about death and dying. And we had people come up and tell their stories. It was really moving. And the feedback that we got from the people who weren't part of the party, the bar goers, they kept finding us and wanting to tell us their story. It's moments like these. I do a lot of community engagement and education. I, I talk at libraries and senior centers and all these spaces to try to increase education and understanding of ended life. And we are using the death deck and our new deck, the EOL deck which is our deck for people with serious illness. So our EOL deck, we launched last year, and that one is our more sensitive deck. So between those two decks, depending on the group, I'm speaking to these different communities about death and dying and trying and doing it in a way that's a little less scary because we're using, we're using friendly cards. I, I have to tell you, I come from a very large... Irish family on one side, my mom's side. And my first encounter with death was my a neighbor, Joey Buffo. I can still remember him. I was in second grade. We'd all gone, received communion for our first communion. And after that, Joey was diagnosed with uh, leukemia. Now here I am, a little kid. And he died. And he, his family was Italian. And this is in the 60s, 1960s. And it's in Pittsburgh. And they had him laid out in his home in a coffin. Mm. And um, that was my first real experience. My mom, I, she, I said, I'm going to go over and see uh, Joey. They have him. He's laid out. I didn't have any uh, um, thought as to what that meant. But I remember going over there and feeling incredibly sad that they had lost their child and I had lost my friend. And uh, a few months later, my grandmother died, my, my maternal grandmother. And the Irish, I, it, it's, we uh, embrace and, and celebrate life. When my grandmother died, and we, I had a huge, huge Irish family, we're standing around, we're talking. Of course, you always go to the home and you do it for three days. It's exhausting. And you sit around and you talk and you drink and you eat and you just remember, you, you hold those memories. And I'll never forget when my mother died, my, I, I was engaged at the time. I was, well, no, I wasn't engaged. It was my boyfriend. We got engaged later. It's the guy I married. He was so offended. He had never been around death and dying. He was an Indiana boy. And he was offended that we were laughing and giggling and talking and crying and just celebrating my mom's life as well as trying to hold on to memories because we were losing her through death. And I was shocked because that was my first experience with somebody who's, oh, you celebrate life. And he really had a hard time handling that. He left in a tither. He was like, I'm out of here. I can't deal with this. He was better. I have a, an old, my oldest son was a disabled vet with a terrible pain condition called chronic regional pain syndrome. And the substandard and abusive care by our veterans hospital or mili medical military medical delivery system, he committed suicide. It, it was, he attempted once and then eight years later, he was successful. And that takes you to a whole nother ball game and stigma. 
So I'm very open about death and dying and the trauma because I still have complicated grief from not being permitted to talk about my mom and what I was going through, the fear I had. I really appreciate what you're doing. Can you? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about all your losses, but particularly your your son to suicide. That, this, that's, that's an extremely difficult. Um, it, it is, and carry. it's a, such a stigma. And as the mother, you're looked at, and I get all weepy even still now. It's twelve years. Sure. People blame it on you, and that's a whole nother ball grade. People are. I, I one thing I experienced with death and dying with both my mother and my son is that people have a tendency to avoid you after the death and after everything goes on. And that is so hurtful and harmful. What do you think I'm going to do? Break because you say the wrong thing? And I'm like, I, I, I just sometimes just to make people feel uncomfortable. And I do that. I'll say, he died. He killed himself. What can I do? There was nothing I could do. He was in pain. And uh, the other thing I find offensive is he's in a better place. That may be your response, but that's not how I feel. Uh, I feel like we mm. failed him. Our, our medical delivery system failed him. So mm. I'm really excited about the death deck. And I'm really, I didn't know about the L. Is that what it is? End of life. Even end of, oh, end of, oh, geez. End of life. Yes. I've got to learn more about that in the future because I think one of the things we do, I have an elder care communication course. And I address, it's like a 20 lesson course and I break it down into the challenging and difficult topics because people don't know how to have those conversations. They really don't. Lisa, can you tell me if those healthcare professionals can benefit from using the tools like the death deck in their practice? Yes. So we have found with our original product, the death deck, people are using that for advanced care planning activities for estate planning, for, and with, and you can use the death deck with people who are not approaching the end of life. Because we use a lot of humor and the questions have such a range of topics, I don't really recommend it for people who are approaching end of life. That's why we created the EOL deck. Because with that, there's just a touch of humor, like a tiny bit of sassy grandma. So it's mostly just a casual tone and we go really deep into end of life preferences, all the senses. We have, a, there are multiple choice questions. So what would you like to hear? And we give some ideas of what people, A, B, and C, what they might want to hear in their final days, how comfortable they are with touch, how direct they would like medical professionals to be with them, if they have a pulse, if that's something they would consider. So we do a lot of education within the cards to explain what a pulse is, palliative care, hospice, and then ask people their thoughts on these topics. So it's a great conversation starter for people who are either aging, where we want to be a little more respectful, or people with serious illness that um, we want to be able to begin these conversations. And what I found as a hospice social worker I don't tell them that I created the deck because I'm still working and that's a conflict of interest. I just tell them I have a deck of cards and it's so helpful for me, even though I created these questions, to have that little, to have the card in front of you, it makes it feel like I'm not asking these really intimate questions the card is. And so the feedback we've been getting is that it's, it's helpful. It also gives the person something to hold on to and look at and it's, it just makes it slightly less vulnerable for the patient that they're working. Well, you're invoking or uh, utilizing all the senses, the sight, hearing, feeling. And, and I want to stop you just for a minute, Lisa, because I want to explain to our listeners what a pulse is. They may be aware of it. It's a P-O-L-S-T, and that's physician-ordered life-sustaining treatment. And that is a portable medical order written by a physician that will tell the a person of uh, the uh, first responders if they're called to the home what treatments can and cannot be performed on the patient according to their wishes this is um not like a dnr because a dnr or an advanced directive 
if you're called to an in an emergency to a home and a person has a DNR, it is not honored by first responders or the hospital because they have to act. If you don't want, in fact, I just recently um, got a post for two 90-year-old clients of mine um, because they were worried that if they fell and they they didn't want to go to the hospital, that one of them called or somebody else called the family, they would be, and this happens all the time. People feel helpless. They want to call and get help, and it's the right thing to do, but then all their, the, nothing's honored. So I just wanted to address that. So that people understand there is a difference between a post and a DNR. It, it's all complicated. And so, Alicia, yes, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. No, I appreciate it. You know, what we forget is healthcare professionals, what we know and what others don't. I, I know I deal with it all the time. I've been working with family caregivers for, I've been a nurse for 50 years, so it's been a long time. <laughs> now, Alicia, you're on the rack now. <laughs> I'm up. But yes, you're up, baby. Now, can you explain to the audience just what a death doula is? A death doula is somebody who helps a person who is nearing the end of life, at the end of life, been diagnosed with a terminal illness to reach the end of life with their wishes in place, with to achieve their idea of a good death. We're there to help this, the individual as well as their families. So often you'll have a patient not have their wishes met, either because the family members get involved or something happens within the healthcare system. And all of a sudden these patients who wanted to be on hospice and pass at home when X, Y, and Z happening are suddenly in a cold, sterile environment at the hospital with no family around or family that, honestly, they didn't like and didn't want to be around with. And the role of a death doula is to help a person come to accept death, come to understand death, prepare for death, Everything from advanced directives, getting their legal affairs in order to planning vigil service for when they are actively dying to planning legacy projects, working with the family about education on what a dying, a death looks like when a person is actively dying. I think that's really important because I'm always coming across of caregivers that the family member, the, the aging family member or the dying family member wants to be put on hospice. But then all of a sudden you have a situation where the family says, hospice is killing my mother or my father. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, I have come across it so many times in my, in my career where the family uh, doesn't want to take uh, their family member off life support because they they still have hope, e even if it's an older person, and they don't get that the brain isn't functioning, that they're never going to come back, and they they don't understand the difference from life sus sustaining treatment versus life ex ex just life extended or curative measures, if you will. As a death doula, what does your role entail? And how do you support individuals and families through this journey? I'm sure you're challenged. <laughs> Every life situation stage is challenging. We, there's no easy way to get out of this. Every individual is different. Everybody's needs are going to be different. From the beginning, you find out what your person wants and needs. Some people may need help with the legalities, with the paperwork part of it. Some people may need help planning the funeral, planning the services, planning legacy work, planning things of that nature. 
other people may want to plan the vigil services. They may need the emotional support. They may just want somebody to sit with and talk to about death and dying and the afterlife, what they could expect their own life. They just may need somebody there with them. They may need, need help with family intervention. Some families don't know how to handle these emotions because when they have a loved one dying, everything comes up and it's not always, it's not always pretty. Things can turn hostile. And they may uh, need... a big Irish family, I can tell you things got hostile often. <laughs> I was, I myself, <laughs> yeah, when I was caregiving for my mother-in-law, I was in a very difficult environment. Yeah. They may not understand hospice or hospital. They have to educate on a lot of different areas. I believe our movie industry, our entertainment industry has glorified death, which is sad because people aren't beautiful and perfect and they don't just go to sleep and and then no, and they never wake up. It just doesn't happen like that. I'll never, no, no. It, it doesn't. I'll never forget this very good looking, handsome 35 year old man was at in the cancer center I was working at. And he, he, his initial diagnosis what hit, a, it wasn't glioblastoma, but it was some kind of brain tumor that was inoperable. And when he came back in a few months later, his head was distorted. His body was huge from steroids. And he was a, just, you didn't know who he was except for his personality. You didn't know. I'll never forget. He's laying in his bed and we're talking to the hospice with him and his wife and his mom and dad. Uh, his wife was pregnant with their first child. So I get all weepy about this. But he said to me, Am I going to look like this when I die? Or am I going to go back to my normal self first? I was like, oh. And I actually had another patient. She was beautiful. She had beat breast cancer once. It came back. And do you know, she was so vain. She kept it the second round of cancer, breast cancer, away from her family until it was beyond treatment because she didn't want to lose her hair and look terrible before she died. And the way that, that, that we approach this is she wanted a special designer headstone. She wanted a special casket. That was her way of handling her death and dying process. And that's her way, you know, perfectly yes, fine. Exactly. I'm hearing more and more about the um, life celebrations that people are having instead of a funeral. And that would be me. Come on. Of course, I'd want to cook and, and make all the food. <laughs> and and that's, something, that's something, too. Yes. I, uh, people are doing that a lot more yes. because, one, they want to be involved. They have these ideas. And they want to see it come to fruition. And a lot of people just think, if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. So they want to do it themselves. But I think it's a great idea to get everybody together one more time and I see everybody. Really because know. it's so often you only get together when somebody dies. Or weddings. Yes. Or weddings. Or yes. Yes. People don't even gather for births anymore because we don't have enough of them. But <laughs> so I'm really, I know when we had my son's funeral, it was a military funeral and I was totally in shock and I, everybody was shocked because I said, of course, this is the husband who walked out when my mom had died 15, 20 years earlier. And I said, we are going to, I want everybody to come to the house. We're going to have amazing food. And I just want people to celebrate Jeff's life, remember him for who he was and what he accomplished in his short time with us and not to think about the bad. And my, my husband, now ex-husband, was upset at first. And then he goes, all right, have it your way. I was going to anyway. I, I wanted to do what was best for everybody. 
So I have a question for you, Alicia. So how do you think society can better support caregivers, particularly those for caring for someone at the end of life? Oh, my. That's a heavy question. I, I know. Mm. When it comes to caregivers and support, there can't be enough on any level. You know, and we really, as a that society, let our, our family caregivers down. Side note, death doulas also provide support for caregivers. That comes on an individual choice, <laughs> but they can do anything from overnights, again, it's a personal pr preference for the doula, to giving them a night off and sitting with the individual. But as a society, well, we've really lost the concept of community, of pulling together, you know, of the village system. And I think we need to bring a little bit more of that back. I think when someone's having a tough time and like we do when someone has a baby, you bring over a casserole. You do a little laundry. Yeah. You come sit and hold the baby so they can take a shower. I think there would there sh there should be a little bit more of that stuff involved. But it doesn't have to be staying for a whole night so that they can go out and about. It doesn't have to be letting them go get a pedicure and get their hair done. Simple things like bringing over a meal or letting them take a shower. Or even sitting with them and having a cup of coffee with their loved one just to provide extra support and a it conversation. Awesome. Yes. Because being a caregiver is very isolating. And the isolation can be very intense. And it's not good mentally. There's, I think we need to have more resources put in place on local levels as well as state levels as well for the caregiver for things sure. such agree. as the yeah. thing things like funding and respite care and maybe transportation i don't even know that there's so many things things like meals something like meals on wheels could be involved if, if the if the person dying can't eat at least the caregiver can oh i didn't say that did i <laughs> I've seen it's necessary. God bless. It's necessary because the caregiver, when the person is dying, when I was taking care of my mother-in-law, I was her hospice caregiver. And they were phenomenal. And that one experience is what made me decide to become a death doula. And uh, but she was being cared for. Yeah. But I wasn't because I have no time. I had no energy. I had no desire because I needed to be with her. Mm -hmm. I needed to be with her for several reasons. And it, it would be great for somebody to bring over food for the caregiver. I have another question for both of you so you could take turns answering it. What can we learn from different cultural attitudes towards death and dying? Lisa, you probably have had a lot more experience with different cultures because you have been in the field for so long in hospice. Yeah, I think there's so many fascinating differences among cultures. Here in the U.S., we, as we talked about before, tend to be death avoidant, but yeah. other cultures are doing a better job of being more open about death and dying and have different, there's a lot of differences in burial or disposition yep. afterwards. Yes. Uh, so I, what I love about my hospice role is that I, I live in the a community and, and so I get to go into the homes of lots of different community members. And so mm -hmm. that the cross-cultural experience means that I am just like with with everyone, I'm meeting people wherever they are, and I am asking a lot of questions. And I think this is one of the ways to for us to be culturally sensitive and appropriate with our clients yeah. is to be asking them because we also don't want to make assumptions because in in Chinese 
beliefs, you're not supposed to talk about death. It, it, it can make it happen. And so being mindful of some of these things, right? But also checking in with the family and being comfortable in that yes. and learning how to ask questions in an appropriate way to say, I know that traditionally, this is the belief, is this how your family operates as well? And how would you like us to navigate that together? Because we all know what's happening because the person's on hospice. But yet, I want to make sure that I am being, that I am upholding your beliefs and not causing distress by talking in a manner that isn't consistent with that. Over my 50 years of nursing, I've experienced um, some beautiful death and dying rituals from different the different cultures and the the Jewish the Jews have this beautiful process that they sit oh it just went out of my mind shiva thank, shiva yeah thank you <laughs> thanks I had a senior moment they sit shiva and one of the things that I loved about this the one service I've been to several but this one service they drove the casket past the house as a way to say goodbye for the last time and so they went from the temple or the synagogue past the house before they took them took Joe to the burial plot and I just thought that was just a it's a touching moment and then I had the experience of a Chinese family. The, the, I went to a service. They had their visiting services and I was, they were all sitting vigil and that was an impressive thing. And then I've been to the Italians where they have their professional warriors who are, they're weeping and crying and it's, oh, wow. everything about each culture brings such an amazing a sense of finality or it gives a connection to the next world. And I really appreciated that. I think that we in healthcare, the professionals, except for people in hospice, I'm going to qualify that, are ignorant or unaware of how the cultural differences and our assumptions can negatively impact the experience of the death and dying process. Um, I've seen that happen as well. So I'm going to ask you both, have, how has your work in the field of death and dying influenced your personal views on life and mortality? Alicia, I'm going to have you answer that first, and then I'll have Lisa answer it. Well, I, it's inevitable. It We're all sure. going to die. Yeah. Just like we all live. And we only get one shot at it. Mm -hmm. to, to, to just be frank, it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But there's going to be some incredibly powerful moments. Some incredibly beautiful moments. And there's going to be some very scary moments too. Because you're uncertain. And we don't know what's coming up ahead of us. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. And that's the same thing with death. We don't know what's really going to happen. We don't really know what's on the other side. But we do know it doesn't have to be ugly. We do know it doesn't have to be painful. We do know that it can be calm and relaxing and so full of love. It can be a sacred event. I like that perspective. So, Lisa, how has your work in the field of death and dying influenced your personal views on life and mortality? I like what Alicia said because I, I think people people imagine what you imagine is typically worse than what dying really looks like, especially when you have support in place. So I appreciate your comments, Alicia. For me, part of the reason we created the death deck was to increase mortality, aware mortality awareness and to help people recognize that if we start living as though we are going to die one day, which is in fact true, yeah. if we are mindful, and I know we use that term a lot now, but if we are thoughtful, if each day we actually think about the fact like for me, I probably am over halfway through my life right now. 
And thinking about that and knowing that there's going to be some health decline and all these other factors, it gives me this feeling of there's so much I want to do. How can I make the most of this? It's the Mary Oliver, this one beautiful ride. How do you make the most of this one beautiful ride that we have? And I think it can be really inspiring. And if you live your life thinking about what will people say about me when I'm dying, that can also help you live with the values and, and legacy that you want to create. I like that. I like that a lot. So I, I want to talk to you finally, for both of you, I have a question to ask. How do you both find joy and meaning in work that is centered around death and dying? I find the beauty in it. There's a lot of things associated with death. And one of them is life. When that is the end, and you've seen a lot of death. I had a lot of death happen starting very young in my life. And I've seen multiple types of death, natural death, cancer, domestic violence, suicide, murder, everything. And it all comes with its different types of grief and planning processes and family moments and, and just so many it's all different and within those processes there's so much beauty to be found you have such profound thoughts that happen about yourself you learn so much about yourself you learn so much about family members you can see beautiful pictures in different lights a simple object that belonged to the loved one like a t-shirt or a guitar or a CD becomes so much more special. And you, in turn, gain so much more appreciation for a sunset, a cup of coffee, a walk in the park, that trip to the beach, going to Alaska, because that's what they always would have wanted. It makes you appreciate everything so much more. I have to agree with that. My my son died 12 years ago, and I still have... He was a big ginger guy. Beard. He was a soldier. He was strong. And I still have... And I wear it. It's a big, bulky, blue uh, hoodie sweatshirt. It's way too big for me. I don't care. I just feel like when I need to be around him, I put that on. That sounds silly, but it makes me feel better. It's absolutely not silly. I, I think I, that's fabulous. So people think, oh, you're just corny. Yeah, I am. But we all find comfort in the little things. And that's, I think, really important. Lisa, tell me, how do you find joy, in, especially the turnover rate and the burnout rate in hospice is huge because it's so emotionally draining. How do you stay upbeat? And how do you stay? on top of things and enjoy life and not be a, a Debbie Downer every time you turn around. A couple of ways. I think similar to Alicia, I get to witness a lot of beautiful and powerful moments. And I go into all these homes around LA and I find that people are good and people are taking care of each other and people are loving on each other. And it's actually really life affirming to watch families come together and take care of one another. Yeah. It makes me feel really grateful for my health. And it helps me with that mortality awareness that I was talking about earlier, where I feel like it, it actually helps me live a happier life to really be working in death and understanding that this time is so precious. Um, and then the other way that I, I cope is I do all this community education and engagement. I take a more macro perspective because I think sometimes if you're just in the weeds and you're just like patient after patient and you don't scale out and see the big picture mm -hmm. and what we're doing collectively, it, it can get, it can lead to burnout. And so I try to go wider and do more of the educational piece to balance some of that bedside time. And I saw in your bio that pickles and peanuts are your 
Our cats provide a lot of comedic relief in our house. <laughs> Alicia also has a cat, Ella. Is that her name, Alicia? Is Ella, that? yes. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> she's in heat right now and she's going, what? <laughs> Been quiet. And she get quiet for this whole thing. God bless her. Ladies, I really want to thank you for joining me today. I, I It's a difficult topic. And I think from my perspective with what's going on in the world, it's just nice that we can change our part of the world and those around us and help them get through some very difficult, challenging times. I'm going to put contact information on how to get a the death deck game on the website and alicia i'll put your contact information for those living in connecticut that or anybody who wants to do death doula via tele visit that's fine too thank you ladies uh, and for the family caregivers out there remember you are the most important part of the family caregiving equation without you it all falls apart so please learn to be gentle with yourself Practice self-care every day because you are worth it. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss an episode of Caregiver Relief. If you have any thoughts, ideas, or suggestions for future videos, topics you'd like us to cover, or even improvements you'd like to see on the channel, drop them in the comments below.